Good morning. It is good to be with you this morning, and whether you are here in the sanctuary with us or you're watching from home, it's good for all of us to be together. And this month, while our lead minister, James Cabal Komodo, is away on some well-deserved time off, I am offering a three-part sermon series called Preaching with the Stars. And we're going to reflect together each of these three weeks on a historical sermon or essay or book um, and other texts in our Unitarian Universalist religious heritage. So as we settle into our time of worship together for this week's exploration of our Universalist roots, I offer these words by the American Universalist minister and outspoken pacifist, Reverend Clinton Lee Scott. May they help center our minds and our hearts this morning. From the east comes the sun, bringing a new and unspoiled day. It has already circled the earth and looked upon distant lands and faraway peoples. It has passed over mountain ranges and the waters of the seven seas. It has shone upon laborers in the fields, into the windows of homes and shops and factories. It has beheld proud cities with gleaming towers and also the hovels of the poor. It has been witness to both good and evil, the works of honest men and women and the conspiracy of knaves. It has seen marching armies, bomb-blasted villages, and the destruction that wasteth at noonday. Now, unsullied from its tireless journey, it comes to us, messenger of the morning, harbinger of a new day. So come, my friends, come, and let's worship together. sun comes shining through. If you light up your face with laughter, hide every trace of sadness, although a tear may be ever so near, it's the time you must keep on trying smile there's no use in crying you'll see the sun come shining through if you just smile find that life is still worthwhile if you just smile. Good morning. The flaming chalice is the symbol of the Unitarian Universalist tradition, the liberal religious tradition to which this congregation belongs. I invite you to rise in body or spirit for the lighting of our chalice. If you have a chalice at home, I invite you to light it with us at this time. Will you please join me in reciting the words on the screen? As we kindle this flame, 
we recommit ourselves to the mission of this congregation to build a Unitarian Universalist community that transforms lives and empowers people to serve the world. May the light of this flame be welcoming to all who seek a liberal religious home. Please remain standing. Our opening hymn this morning is number 34, Though I May Speak With Bravest Fire. I invite you to sing along quietly with your mask on. Good morning. I'm Becky Elliott, a worship associate and a member of this congregation. If you're visiting us for the first time this morning, either in person or online, I offer you a very special welcome. Here at the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Raleigh, we are intentionally inclusive, liberally religious, and actively serving the common good of our shared world. Whoever you are, and wherever you are on your own religious journey, you are welcome here. As Unitarian Universalists, we seek wisdom and inspiration from many sources, but affirm our own individual experience and conscience as the best authority for our beliefs. We are committed to making our world more compassionate and just and hope you might join us with one of our many efforts to do so. If you are visiting us for the first time in person and haven't already done so, I invite you to stop by our visitor stand after the service, which is immediately outside our sanctuary doors. If you are visiting us for the first time online, I invite you to fill out our visitor form at uufr.org slash visitor form. If you do this, you'll start receiving our e-newsletter. For those of you here in person, our social hour this morning will be outside on our upper fellowship hall patio. After you get your coffee, feel free to remain on the patio 
or wander down to the lower courtyard or the memorial garden. Since we're not on Zoom and we don't have our names below our faces, please remember to wear your name tag. Name tag racks are now located in the lower entryway. For everybody online, feel free to join us for our online social hour immediately after the service. There are instructions on how to do this on our website. As we meet and greet each other this morning, please remember to ask others whether they are most comfortable hugging, shaking hands, elbow bumping, or just waving wistfully from afar. I invite you now to meet and greet each other. For everybody at home, please, please use the chat function on your screen. Let's continue those conversations during a social hour. There will be plenty of time for catch up. This is the time in our service when we acknowledge some of the joys and the sorrows of our community. Anyone is invited to email a joy or sorrow to joysandsorrows at uefr.org before 9 a.m. on Sunday. And anyone is also invited to light a candle before our service and fill out one of our cards. And folks at home may share a joy or sorrow using the chat function on your screen. I'll share some of the joys and sorrows that I've received through email now. Our music director, Scott McKenzie's mother, passed away this past Monday, June 26th, after a long illness, so uh, uh, July 26th. And Scott is away right now with his family, and they celebrated her life yesterday. We hold Scott and his family and all his loved ones in our hearts during this time of grief. And it's also with sadness that I share the deaths of two past longtime members of UUFR. Susanna Clark, who was also the act outdoor activities director for many years at Susie and SWIM, passed away on Friday evening. And former member Freka Cole, who had lived in California for many years after being a member here for many years, passed away on Wednesday morning at the age of 100 years old. We hold the families of Susanna and Freka and all who loved them in our hearts this morning. And we also have a joy to share this morning. Marge Link shares that her whole family is extremely proud of her grandson who received his Green Beret in the Army Special Forces two weeks ago. Congratulations to you, Marge, and to your grandson. And as we reflect on these shared joys and sorrows, as well as the joys and sorrows and fears and hopes of our own lives, let's be together now for a time of stillness and silence, opening ourselves up to that spirit within us, between us, amidst us and among us, that's called by many names, but known to every human heart, that leads us toward a fuller experience of life. And after the silence, we will remain seated and we will sing hymn number 95, There is more love somewhere with our masks on. But now let's be together in stillness and in silence.
As the Universalist and Unitarian minister, the Reverend John Wood once said, a candle must give itself away. In the giving, the spending, the spreading, the sending, it finds itself. Much of what we love here at UUFR is only possible because of the generous financial gifts so many of you provide. These gifts make a difference in the lives of people within the walls of this congregation and in the larger world. Will the ushers please come forward to collect the offering? It's also possible to give using one of the methods posted on our screen. Please be generous and thank you.
Thank you, Billy. For our readings this morning, I offer you four excerpts from Hosea Ballou's Treatise on Atonement. Ballou was a Universalist minister who preached an understanding of universal salvation that, while very different from what many UUs believe today, was quite ahead of his time, even among his Universalist peers. In our first excerpt, Ballou critiques not only the idea of eternal damnation, but also the notion that Jesus' death saved us from hell. He wrote, the belief that the great Jehovah was so offended with his creatures that nothing but the death of Christ or the endless ministry of mankind could appease his anger is an idea that has done more injury to the Christian religion than the writings of all its opposers. The error has been fatal to the life and spirit of the religion of Christ in our world. All those principles which are to be dreaded by men have been believed to exist in God and professors have been molded into the image of their deity and become more cruel. Those ideas have so obscured the whole nature of God from us that even the tender charities of nature have been frozen with such tenets. The natural friendship common to human society has in a thousand instances been driven from the walks of man. In our second set of excerpts, Ballou rejects the image of an angry, punishing God, instead offering an image of a loving, healing God. God's moral law is like himself, love. God is love, and he who, dwell, and he who loveth dwelleth in God, and God in him. It requires all moral beings to love God and each other. And the reason why it commands this is it is love itself. True, that soul is miserable that does not love God. And the reasons are love is the life and happiness of the soul and hatred is its death and misery. There is nothing in heaven above nor in the earth beneath that can do away with sin but love. We have reason to be thankful that love is stronger than death. Many waters cannot quench it, nor the floods drown it. It hath power to remove the moral maladies of mankind. O oh, love, thou great physician of souls, what a work hast thou undertaken. In our third excerpt, Ballou argues that none of us are destined for hell or eternal separation from God. Instead, every person, no matter how far we stray, is destined to return to God. Mankind originated in God. Why then do we deny his final assimilation with the fountain from whence he sprang? The streams and rivulets which water the hill country run in every direction. They are stained with various mines and soils through which they pass, but at last they find their entrance into the ocean where their different courses are at an end. Though man at present forms an aspect similar to the waters in their various courses, yet in the end of his race will enjoy union with his God and with his fellows. In our final excerpt, Ballou offers a vision of what universal salvation, a world in which all are saved, might be like. The fullness of times will come. Then shall truth be victorious and all error flee to eternal night. 
Then shall universal songs of honor be sung to the praise of him who liveth forever and ever. All death, sorrow, and crying shall be done away. Pains and disorders shall be no more felt. Temptations no more trouble the lovers of God. Universal nature shall be brought in perfect union with truth and holiness, and, in th and the Spirit of God fill all rational beings. Today we're going to take a look at a very old and troubling concept. It's a concept that makes many religious liberals, especially Unitarian Universalists, cringe. This concept is such a downer that we often avoid talking about it. It's an idea that can make us feel bad about ourselves. It can make us feel bad too about one another, our world, and our future. It can make us feel ashamed fearful, or holier than thou. So no wonder we avoid or even outright, outright reject the idea. But we have to talk about this concept today, despite the ick factor. After all, there's little that we can say about Hosea Balu or his contributions to Unitarian Universalism without addressing the idea so central to his thought. You may have picked up on the concept we'll be looking at when you heard our readings earlier. That's right, today we're going to be exploring sin. Sin and its related concept, salvation. Now those of you who may be newer to Unitarian Universalism might be feeling a little bit confused right now. It may make sense to hear about a reluctance to talk about sin, but you may be wondering why in the world would you use, have an aversion to the idea of salvation? I've been asked before by folks from more religious, traditional religious groups, why you use, even bother gathering together on Sunday morning, if not to save our souls. For many people, religion is fundamentally about salvation, so it can be really hard then to understand the Unitarian Universalist reluctance to talk about sin and salvation. UUs have many reasons why we are uncomfortable with these concepts. We are different people with different life experiences. We come to Unitarian Universalism from many different places, but many of us come by our aversion to discussion of sin and salvation from a couple of similar angles. For instance, raise your hand or type yes into the chat if you have ever been told that you deserve to burn eternally in hell because of your sins. And now raise your hand if one of your loved ones has been told that. I'm guessing that pretty much everybody has heard that at some point or another. Many of you use avoid or even reject the ideas of sin and salvation because we have these painful experiences when these concepts were weaponized against us. Perhaps we were told that our love for someone of our own gender is sinful. Perhaps we were told that we had to force ourselves to believe something that did not resonate in our hearts or we would burn eternally in the next life. When I was a young teen, I was told that I was committing the sin of idolatry and witchcraft and in danger of going to hell. 
and my crime was that I was wearing a necklace with a little Ankh pendant, which is an ancient Egyptian symbol of life. These kinds of experiences can leave a bad taste in the mouth and scars in the soul when we hear words like sin and salvation that remind us of these kinds of encounters with religious intolerance and even religious abuse. We're reminded of times when they were weaponized against us to try to force us to conform through fear or through shame. And then others may reject the ideas of sin and salvation because these concepts just don't make sense to them, especially as popularly understood. These are folks who've examined their own conscience and tried to look at the ideas rationally. They've explored different understandings of them that are out in the world and tried to see if any of those fit with what they've personally come to know about the universe and about life. And in the end, they've found little reason to believe in sin or salvation, at least, again, as these ideas are popularly understood. For example, Hosea Balu denied the existence of hell and the necessity of salvation from eternal damnation on a rational basis. He examined the arguments that were common at his time and are actually pretty common in our own time as well, and he countered them one by one. Like Balu, modern Unitarian Universalists may reject the idea that human moral transgression is supernatural in nature and thus has supernatural consequences. Many of us believe that human wrongdoing has natural origins rather than being the result of a divine curse imposed upon human beings as a consequence of Adam and Eve's disobedience against God. For example, Balu argued that if there is a God, and if that God is just, God would not punish one person for another person's wrongdoing. And so he argued that the human capacity for wrongdoing is not something that is passed down through the generations by supernatural means. Instead, he argues that sin is a natural part of human nature. It's simply a consequence of how the world and our bodies and our minds are composed. Human beings, he argued, engage in wrongdoing as well as virtuous behavior because we are biologically and psychologically built to pursue happiness. Sometimes we pursue happiness in ways that are life-giving. But the exact same mechanisms that drive and enable us to engage in virtuous behavior also drive and enable us to engage in harmful behavior, and you can't have one without the other. And it's not some supernatural entity, not a rebellious angel or devil that drives and enables harmful behavior. Ballou, like many modern Unitarian Universalists, also rejected the existence of Satan. He found the existence of Sat the idea of Satan's existence inconsistent with his understanding of God as great and as good. He did not believe that an all-powerful, just, or loving God would permit the existence or the interference of an evil entity like Satan. He compared it to a parent knowingly endangering a child. God would not allow an evil entity like Satan to prey on God's children. And so he rejected Satan's existence on the basis of his own belief in God's goodness and power. He also did not believe that a loving God would permit the existence of a place like hell where sinners would suffer eternal misery. And he had an interesting argument. In fact, he had many interesting arguments um, for his beliefs. And this interesting argument for why hell made no sense to him was especially enlightening. Heaven, he said, should be a place of eternal, unlimited happiness. No one, he argued, can be fully happy knowing that even a single person is suffering for eternity. 
And so he did not think that heaven and hell could possibly coexist. And since he didn't think that there was such a thing as original sin, Satan, or hell, Balu saw no reason at all to believe that human beings need to be saved from them. But to be clear, Hosea Balu and his universalist contemporaries were Christians. They believed in God, Jesus, heaven, and more. And yet they differed from many other 19th century Christians in that they believed that if anyone went to heaven, then everybody went to heaven. If anybody was saved, everyone was saved. I find it interesting, though, that Balu did not conflate salvation with going to heaven. For him, they weren't quite the same thing. To be sure, he did believe that everyone goes to heaven when we die, no matter how well we live our lives. But without original sin, Satan, or hell, he didn't think that there was anything we needed to be saved from in order to be able to go to heaven. There were no barriers. We just go. Instead, salvation for Balu is something that happens in this life. To understand how Balu understood salvation, we have to understand how he understood sin. As I said before, he rejected original sin, this theological concept that all humans supernaturally inherit a corrupt nature from Adam and Eve, and so deserve to go to hell. He rejected that idea. But he did believe that there is such a thing as sin. Sin, in his understanding, is simply wrongdoing. Humans sin when we knowingly do something harmful even though we are aware that it is harmful and that we shouldn't do it. Sin, he argues, is something we engage in for natural reasons, not supernatural reasons. We're driven to engage in wrongdoing, you may recall, as well as virtuous behavior because we're naturally inclined to pursue happiness. Balu said, man's main object and all he does is happiness knowing that his own happiness is connected with the happiness of his fellow men induces him to deal mercifully with all. But a man acting for his own happiness, if he seek it in a narrow circle of partiality and covetousness, his selfishness then is irreligious and wicked. As we might say today, we are hardwired to pursue happiness and sometimes harmful things do make us happy, at least for a moment. Think, for instance, of the last time that you spoke to a loved one in anger. You really got them. Sometimes those hurtful words just feel so satisfying. Sometimes wrongdoing feels good, at least for a while. And so we sin. No devil makes us do it. No ancient transgression against God twists our souls toward evil. Wrongdoing is caused by natural factors, like how our bodies and our minds work. Balu described it like this. Evil is the necessary result of the physical organization and constitution of human nature. In the elements of which our bodies are composed, we discover ample provisions for all manner of disorders. He argued that the physical composition of our bodies gives rise to our senses. Our senses in turn shape our desires, our thoughts and our intentions, and they in turn shape a wide variety of moral and immoral behaviors. In fact, he argues that in order for us to have moral behavior, we by necessity also have to have immoral behavior because the same biological and psychological factors that make right action possible also make wrongdoing possible. While we modern Unitarian Universalists may not embrace the word sin, we do believe that human beings are capable of wrongdoing. In fact, the passion for justice that drives so many of us to try to make the world better is strongly tied to our awareness 
of humanity's capacity for great harm. Justice making is so much about writing the consequences of our wrongdoing. And so we know that people can engage in wrongdoing as individual people. We hurt those we love and those that we don't even know all the time. We say hurtful words. We re reject and neglect our obligations when others are depending on us to do the right thing. And we give in now and then to selfishness, even though it sometimes hurts others. And we err collectively as well. Environmental devastation, economic oppression, and political violence are just some examples of sins that we human beings commit against one another and our planet. Such large-scale harm depends on systems that are built and maintained by countless people, and so the sin there, the wrongdoing, is collective. The consequence of sin, in Balu's understanding as well as that of many modern Unitarian Universalists, is not supernatural. I want to emphasize it again, that the consequences are not supernatural. We don't believe that we go to hell for our sins. We don't believe that our sins somehow tarnish our souls for all of eternity. But we do believe that sins, that wrongdoing, has consequences. The harm that we cause in turn causes misery. Obviously, those who are directly harmed suffer, but, you know, if, if someone slaps me in anger, it, it hurts me, but at the same time, it hurts them as well, or at least I hope it does. We're hardwired to seek happiness, our own happiness and that of others, and when our pursuit of happiness results in harm instead of happiness, we suffer too. Even if it is momentarily satisfying, we still so often feel hurt when we see others in pain, especially because of our actions. We may feel guilty, ashamed, foolish, or weak because of our wrongdoing. We suffer when we sin. And for Balu, it is that suffering and the sin that causes the suffering that we need salvation from, not damnation in hell. We are saved when we are liberated from the things that threaten, harm, and diminish life. That salvation, that liberation, frees us to pursue and partake in that which brings, nurtures, and enlarges life sources of true happiness. Salvation then is about redirecting our natural desire for happiness away from wrongful actions and toward actions that bring forth happiness without harm to ourselves or others. It is like a line from the Bible that I love. I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses, Choose life. We experience salvation any time that we are able to escape making harmful choices or escape the consequences of others' harmful choices and when we instead are able to make good choices. Many things can help us to make such choices and so can help save us. For Balu, a Christian, the most important of course, is God, who he understood to be love. He considered God to be both the ultimate source of happiness as well as the most vital resource in pursuing and creating it. Human beings, he felt, are saved when we enter into relationship with God. God's presence never leaves us, but he believed that we sometimes leave God and need to be reconciled back to God, who's always willing to have us back in relationship. And our relationship with God helps us seek our happiness in good things. The relationship also fortifies us in resisting the temptation to seek our happiness in harmful things. And the relationship helps 
protect or save us from sin. Ballou, of course, understood God in a Christian way as a thinking and feeling deity with a will of his own. We modern Unitarian Universalists, though, may understand God in a whole bunch of different ways or maybe not even believe in God at all. Some of us understand God to be more of an energy, creative process or force alive in the world and moving us toward goodness. Others may believe not in God, but in nature or humanity. Whatever we believe or whatever we call it, if there's a way for us to relate to it, connect to it, or tap into it, that helps us to make good choices and avoid harmful choices, we have encountered the key to our salvation. If you believe in the power of nature, you are saved when you let the power of nature guide you to live in harmony with the natural world in ways that protect the earth and all living beings that depend upon it. If you believe in humanity, you are saved when you are inspired by the flights of the human spirit to create a world that nurtures every person and the human capacity for goodness. It is important then for each of us to search our hearts and get clear about what helps us to imagine, pursue, and live a good life, whether we call that something God or something else. Friends, it's been over 200 years now since Hosea Ballou wrote his treatise on atonement. Universalism and now Unitarian Universalism have changed in many ways over those two centuries. But one thing has remained steady is that sense that we are all, every human being on this planet, on a shared journey with intertwined fates. There is no such thing as salvation for some, but not for all. None of us are saved until all of us are saved because we cannot be truly satisfied or fully happy as long as some among us continue to suffer. Let's work to find that which brings the most profound happiness, whether we call it God or by another name. Let's take time in our lives to connect with the ultimate, however we name it, and let that relationship guide us in how we live our lives. Let's find ways to live our lives in ways that help liberate us, all people, and all beings from suffering. And let's build a world together where all of us will partake happily and fully of life's abundance. Amen. Blessed be. May it be so. In our closing hymn this morning, and I'm hoping maybe we'll be able to get it on the screen, if not, uh, is number 1018 in your teal hymnal, Come and Go With Me. And I invite you to rise as you are able and to sing along with your mask. Yes. 
justice in that land. There'll be justice in that land where I'm bound, where I'm bound. There'll be justice in that land. There'll be justice in that land. There'll be justice in that land where I'm bound. Please be seated. It is time now to bring our time of worship to a close. But as we extinguish this chalice, flame, its light will continue to burn in our hearts. As we go out into our daily lives, let's remember the words of the, unit of the Universalist Unitarian and later Unitarian Universalist minister, Reverend Alfred S. Cole. You may possess a small light but uncover it, let it shine, use it in order to bring more light and understanding to the hearts and minds of men and women. Give them not hell, but hope and courage. Do not push them deeper into their theological despair, but preach the kindness and everlasting love of God. Go in peace. Thank you. 